There's no rush. I'm totally relaxed. And... Chceme startovat. Couple of minutes, uh, people are joining. Yeah. Оля, дивися, тут з тими так само, просити, якщо є питання, піднімати руку, так? Так, так. Okay. Бачу, що хтось випадково навіть підняв руку. Я бачу, що Так, так. Я думаю, що давай ще хвилинку будемо починати. Uh, okay then, I think uh, we can start. Uh, so, uh, uh, good evening, uh, dear friends and colleagues. I think people will be joining us as it was previous time, so it was uh, kind of 10 minutes uh, after we have started, but uh, let's uh, start our event, at least from uh, the present uh, presentation of our today's speaker, but I think uh, all Ukrainian uh, lawyers and all the people who are interested in uh, non-fiction literature knows him uh, know him very well it's uh, philip sands professor of the university college of london and uh, uh, international lawyer who uh, currently is a member of the matrix uh, chambers and uh, philip is uh, well known in ukraine as a researcher of uh, the legacy and uh, history of life of hersh luther uh, and rafa lankin and their and, and their antagonists, mainly from the Nazi side. Uh, people, uh, sorry, uh, Philip is an author of the East West Street book, who was published in 2016 in English and in 2017 in Ukraine uh, by Old uh, Lion Publishing House. And uh, he is currently, he is author of his new book, Red Line, which is, uh, the full name is longer, I think, uh, I think but uh, Redline, which is devoted uh, to the uh, fate, to the end of life of uh, one of the Nazi criminals, Otto von Wachter, who was also a uh, governor of the Galicia and uh, who was responsible for Holocaust and for many other crimes against uh, humanities, which were com committed by Nazis in uh, Galicia and in Ukraine in general. Uh, so. Just to start, I want to, I want to start uh, from the quotation I have read at Wikipedia, uh, at, at page of the Philip Sands, when Philip says that I want to be treated as a as Philip Sands individual, but Philip Sands, but not Philip Sands Brit, Londoner or Jew. Philip, my question is, because today we are speaking and we are, it's conversation with lawyers, is lawyer also on this list? So is it part legal your profession is part of your individuality? Sorry, I've just un I've just unmuted. Sorry. Firstly, Ivan and everyone here, can I just say how incredibly nice it is to be with you today? Um, Lviv has a very special place in my heart. Uh, and I've had probably 15 visits there in the last 10 years. It's been a couple of years since I've been, but I, as soon as COVID is over, I want to be back. Um, Ivan, who is credited in both books, but especially in East West Street, just did an extraordinary role as a wonderful young lawyer in helping me identify archives and documents. And I have a gratitude, and I'll say it publicly, Ivan, that lasts for life. You have my support on anything you need. Um, and those of you who've read East West Street will know that um, that uh, my connection with the city is largely originates with my grandfather, who was born uh, on Sheptitsky Street in 
1904 and lived there for the first 10 years of his life uh, and his family remained. So it's a, you might not only add lawyer, you might add Ukrainian um, or Pole uh, or Austro-Hungarian uh, or Arsenal supporter uh, or any other number of things. Each of us has many labels that we attach to ourselves. Um, and the question that in essence is asked in East West Street is, how do we identify ourselves? Are we predominantly identified by the group or groups we happen to be a member of, or are we treated as individuals? Um, but the answer to your question, Ivan, is yes, I'm a lawyer. First and foremost, I am a lawyer. Uh, I'm a professor at the university, but I'm also a practicing lawyer, and I'm also a part-time judge. So uh, in those three different activities, I have to exercise the qualities of a lawyer. And the qualities of a lawyer, I think, are significant and very special. Um, one of the things I've come to learn is that as lawyers, the most important characteristic that we can have is our spirit of independence. The moment that independence is broken or lost or, or, or disappeared, our real social function as a lawyer is limited. And in doing the research on the two books, East West Street and The Rat Line, on teaching in the classroom, on arguing cases before international courts and tribunals, on sitting as an arbitrator, you know, I'm appointed right now and I sit on a couple of cases appointed by Ukraine as, a, as an arbitrator, uh, I will always be independent and I will do what is right for me, not what is right for anybody else, which means that I will apply the law to the facts and I will treat the assessment of the facts with an independent spirit and I will treat the law with an independent spirit. And I think that does define me and it informs how I wrote these two books and it informs how I think about the characters of Lauterpacht and Lemkin and Hans Frank, we can talk more about them in due course. Right now in my country, the United Kingdom, I'm actually speaking to you from France. I have two nationalities. I live part of the year in France, part of the year in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is in a very difficult place right now. It, you know, as you know, it has left the European Union. And in the last two weeks, for the first time in the history of the United Kingdom, the government has adopted domestic legislation which it recognizes violates an international treaty obligation. Uh, the withdrawal agreement negotiated, signed and ratified with the European Union. Uh, and the support for that was given by the British Attorney General, our highest legal officer. Uh, in the Nuremberg trial, Ivan, that was Shawcross, whose name you remember. Uh, and this Attorney General has said it's fine to break international law in limited and selective ways. It's, it's lawlessness and it's deeply dispiriting. And so the lawyer in me right now is very actively engaged in trying to get her removed as the head of our legal profession. She is the head of the bar of England and Wales. And in my view and in the view of others, she is unfit for public office, having authorized the violation of an international treaty obligation. So in short, yes, the law informs every sinew of my flesh. It's very important part of me. Now, now I have forgotten to uh, uh, put mic on. So thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, my second question uh, will be, in this case, as lawyers, what should and why, what uh, they can learn from the stories of East West Street and uh, Redline. So these two books are most prominent. Redline currently is not published in Ukraine, but hopefully it will be very soon published. I, uh, my fingers are crossed. And uh, what are uh, the lessons which lawyers should learn and or can learn from these two books and from stories I mean, of their apart, at, at yeah. and her protagonists? Ap apart from my grandfather, the book is about three characters, three men, three lawyers. Hirsch Lauterpacht from Lviv, who invented the concept of crimes against humanity. Raphael Lemkin, who spent, I think, six years in Lviv at the university, at the law school, 
who invented the concept of genocide, the protection of groups. And finally, Hans Frank, who was Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer and who came to Lemberg in August 1942 to initiate the destruction of the Jewish community of the city of Lemberg, including my grandfather's family and Lauterpach's family. And then in the rat line, you have a fourth character, Otto Wächter, who lived in Lemberg from February 42 until July 44, who was also a lawyer. And it, if you take the two books together, you learn a number of things. Um, from Lauterpacht and Lemkin, you learn, I think, about the power of legal ideas. Here are two men who found themselves in 1945 in a situation in which their entire families had been disappeared, eliminated. One was a professor, Lauterpacht, one was a prosecutor, Lemkin. Instead of curling up in a corner and weeping and crying, they decided they would use their energies to create these new legal concepts. And that for me is inspiring. They were both informed by the city of Lemberg, Lviv, Lviv. The origins of these two crimes are traced to the legal community in Lviv. They were formed by the university, your university, your law school, Ivan. You have the same formation, the same legal DNA as these two men who changed the world with legal ideas. So that's on the positive side. And for me, that's very, very inspiring. And they both became prosecutors in the famous Nuremberg trial. And one of the people they prosecuted was Hans Frank, a very fine lawyer. He'd been to fabulous law schools in Germany. He was very cultured. He was a friend of the composer Richard Strauss and of famous writers. And the question with Hans Frank that I constantly ask myself is, how could it be that a man who is so cultured and so well trained in law could get involved in mass murder? You know, in 1946, he is hanged in Nuremberg in the courtroom, uh, in, 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 in the courtyard outside the courtroom for murdering four million human beings. So how do you get from being a lawyer committed to upholding the rule of law to signing decrees and decisions which cause four million people to die in manifestly illegal conditions? And of course, I don't have a simple answer to that question. But what I learned from that is as lawyers, we must never cross lines. And that story becomes more acute for me in the rat line, the story of Otto Wächter. And in particular, there is a moment in 1938 that is very powerful in my mind. Wächter by then is 37 years old. He's a practicing lawyer. He has been also to the University of Vienna Law School, which he entered on the same day as Hirsch Lauterpacht whose family he would be responsible for the killing of just 25 years later. He gets involved in minor crimes, attacking Jews in 1921. He joins the Nazi party in 1923. In 1934, he is involved in the killing of the Austrian chancellor, Engelbert Dolphus, and he flees to Berlin, where he becomes a lawyer working for the SS under Heinrich Himmler. So he's at the top table, as we would say in London. Then in 1938, Germany enters Austria and Wächter goes straight back and he stands on that famous day in March 1938 on the platform of the Heldenplatz with Adolf Hitler and with his wife Charlotte. And after Hitler leaves the platform, they go down the stairs, the marble stairs inside the Hofburg Palace in the building. And at the bottom of the marble staircase, a place which I've been to, Wächter says to his wife, um, well, what shall I do? I have a choice. I could resume my legal practice and I could have a good life and I could make good money, or I could go into government service and become a state secretary. Go into government service, says the wife. Now, at that point, you would have imagined that Wächter would bring with him all of his legal knowledge, his training, his commitment to the idea of the rule of law, to fairness, to decency, but he doesn't. Within six months, he has signed letters 
that remove from their jobs two of his teachers at the University of Vienna Law Faculty, and which consigns them to their deaths a few months later in camps in Theresienstadt and other camps. And again, I ask myself the question, how could a lawyer like Wächter do this? How could he become involved in the murder of his own university professors, the people who taught him corporate law and securities law? We have the names, Ivan knows how we find the names and we go and look for the details, but he did. It's not contested. The documents are absolutely clear. And I think that is the big question. And I think it happened in Wächter's case because he permitted himself very early on to cross a line. And when he crossed that line, he saw that actually he didn't pay such a big price. And then he crossed another line and again didn't pay a big price and again crossed another line until ultimately he was involved in mass murder. And he was indicted but never caught. And I think the lesson for me of these lawyers of the Frank and Wächter kind is do not cross lines. If your client tells you to cross a line, even if it's your own government, don't cross the line. Resign. You leave. You stick to your conscience. If you are a judge and someone comes to you and says, here, I'll give you a few thousand dollars to do the thing that would help me, you don't cross that line. And I think that is the crucial message for me of these four lawyers from the two books. Once you cross lines, it is finished. There is no coming back. And that is the big lesson for me. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. A uh, very interesting answer. And the next question is, uh, one of the most, and uh, so to say, uh, interesting things and not very happy things uh, from the East West Street book uh, was the personal stories of Rafael Lemkin and, Hans, uh, and Herschel Lutterbach. Uh, both of them have suffered a big tragedy, which is unimaginable, unfortunately unimaginable in our days. All their families, uh, were practically all, uh, all members of their families were devastated by and were killed during the Holocaust. And uh, it was uh, their life aim, life goal, to change the situation. Lampton was uh, to introduce and to implement uh, genocide as a crime, as a recognized international crime. Lauterpacht worked in uh, uh, worked on crimes against humanity, but uh, all uh, but each of them, Rafael Lemkin and Herschel Lauterpacht, have definitely felt this uh, pain during their life. And uh, for Lemkin, as far as as for me, my conclusion, the, the, this fight for recognizing of genocide. The cost of this fight was his career, his uh, career in academia, at least in practice. And uh, so, uh, for Lauterpacht, maybe it was some, some uh, his personal things. Uh, but uh, still, uh, is there an obligation of all lawyers when they're fighting for justice, fighting for high goals, uh, noble goals? as uh, recognition of national crimes or fighting for justice against premies in the world's history to pay some, uh, some personal price for it. For, for they both, it's a fascinating question, Ivan. They both died young. They both were in their early 60s. Um, they both died of illnesses. Um, I think they both went through tremendous traumas. They were both present in the Nuremberg trial. They were very different characters. Um, Lauterpacht was an establishment character, as we say in England, you know, he was part of the establishment. He was a professor um, at the university in Cambridge. And of course, he then became remarkably Britain's judge at the International Court of Justice. I think you remember the first time I ever met you, Ivan, in that seminar room in the law faculty at Ivan Franco. And I said to the students, could any of you imagine one day that you will be the British judge at the International Court of Justice. And they looked at me like I was a crazy person. Do you, remember, do you remember that? Because that's what happened to Lauterpacht. Lauterpacht was in that seminar room in 1916 and 1917. And 40 years later, in 1955, he is appointed by the British to be a judge at the International Court of Justice, one of the greatest judges the court has ever had 
the greatest international lawyer of the 20th century, and a Lvivian. But he didn't last very long. He died in 1960. Um, he died on the operating table. Uh, he had a cancer. And I think that, yes, um, he paid a big price in his health, including his mental health. Um, and Lemkin also paid a big price in relation to his mental health. But I think if you were to ask them, would they be willing to pay that price to achieve what they did? I think both would say yes. In the case of Lauterpacht, in terms of his significance, one can go even further. As you know, Ivan, Lauterpacht drafted a book in 1945, published by Columbia University Press, called A Bill of, Ra a Bill of International Rights of Man. And this book was the basis for the European Convention on Human Rights and for the modern system of human rights. Lauterpacht is the father of modern human rights. And so in a very real sense, his legacy is felt in the courts in Ukraine today to the extent that they give effect to the European Convention as they are presumably obliged to do, they are effectively applying Lauterpacht's legacy. And he paid a big price uh, for that legacy. And the price went further. You know, I, I knew his son very well. His son, Ellie, was my teacher of international law at the University of Cambridge. And Lauterpacht, the father, never talked to Lauterpacht, the son, about his childhood, about his years in Lviv, about the Nuremberg trial, about anything, because, Ellie told me, it was too painful. So for the next generation also, the children of Lauterpacht, Lemkin didn't have any children, but for the children of Lauterpacht, there was a very big price that was paid. And I think that is clear. Uh, the answer is yes, yes, and yes again, big price. Thank you very, uh, very much. Uh, so lawyers are paying price to achieving the most noble goals, but still what about uh, criminals? Uh, as you may know, as you, uh, in uh, the preface of uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian edition of East West Street, uh, at the end of it, uh, I uh, mentioned that uh, my personal conclusion mm -hmm. from the stories of Lemkin, Luterbach, and especially Frank and Hector was that uh, punishment is inevitable. That justice is inevitable. So any road, all roads uh, of criminals uh, lead them to Nuremberg. So it was mentioned. So is it really true? And uh, in your opinion, if we're talking, for example, about these Holocaust crimes and Holocaust uh, criminals uh, who uh, are responsible, are responsible or are still responsible for Holocaust, uh, are is punishment and justice inevitable for them? And uh, or still there are some roles which from Nuremberg or aside from Nuremberg. It depends, dear Ivan, what you mean by justice. <laughs> if you mean justice delivered by a court of law, then the answer is no. If you mean justice delivered by other means, then the answer is more complex, more nuanced. The Rat Line is essentially a book about justice. The subtitle is Love, Lies and Justice. And it's the story of a man who was involved in the murder of the more than 100,000 citizens of Lviv. That is what he was indicted for in 1945. And he was never caught. And so he was never tried. And he was therefore never sentenced and never convicted. And his son Horst says, therefore, my father is an innocent man. And it is not correct for you to treat him as a criminal or a mass murderer. This is the subject of the book. What happens when someone is not caught? He escaped, he hid in the mountains of Austria for three years, and he then went to Rome where he tried to get on the rat line to escape to South America, but he never made it. He died in mysterious circumstances. And for 70 years, nobody talked about him. He was whitewashed out of the history books until I met the son of Hans Frank, Nicholas Frank, who you know, Ivan, you too have spent time with him. And he introduced me to Horst. And we came together, as you remember, in 2014 
to Lviv. You met both of them. You remember that last lunch that we had together, the four of us with a few other people. And in Lviv, Horst the son had to face justice. We went to the aula of the university and I don't remember if you were there when it happened, but Nicholas Frank read out the speech of his father, praising Horst's father for the crimes he had committed in Lviv. I mean, it was a terrible moment and very painful for Nicholas uh, and Horst became very angry. In a sense, the Ratline book is a trial. It's the trial of Otto and Charlotte Wechter in which I am the judge. And of course that's wrong because I'm not independent. My grandfather's family was involved, so I shouldn't be involved. But I think justice has a long arc. And in Lviv and in other parts of Ukraine and in all parts of the world, we know that justice is imperfect. We know that there are some people who are not uh, caught or who are not charged, or if they are charged, they escape justice by one means or another. We are all familiar with this syndrome. So the short answer is no, but it's a more complex story, I think, in relation to particular individuals. Thank you. So when we're talking and we're using very often as the term justice, and uh, definitely what was justice in 1945 and what is justice in 2020, uh, there, the core meaning is the same, but still some sides of this coin of uh, justice were changed. So in your opinion, when we're talking about justice 1945 and justice 2020, what are the main problems and challenges? You mentioned some at the beginning, very beginning, when you were describing the issue of uh, British uh, Attorney General, which uh, who is uh, uh, saying that it's okay to violate international law. In Ukraine, we are also very carefully uh, looking at the US and what is happening now. These are in policy life and the last uh, Donald Trump's uh, statement, uh, which uh, as, as, as that uh, the elections could not be fi uh, finished uh, of his presidency in case if he's not winning. They, they uh, were, were very attentively studied in Ukraine. So this currently, what now are challenges of justice and what are differences with justice? Well, Justice has changed a lot since 1945, obviously. I mean, we can talk about the national level, but also at the international level. There were no international courts in 1945. Nuremberg was the first. And of course, all roads lead to Nuremberg and all roads lead to the work of Lauterpacht and Lemkin. And uh, to give you an example, it's, uh, it, the system's not perfect. The system is not complete. Terrible things still happen in the world and terrible people still get away with having done terrible things. But there is something. Last December, I was the lead counsel for a small African country, the Gambia, against Myanmar at the International Court of Justice in relation to the treatment of the Rohingya community in Myanmar. And for the people who were in the courtroom, the members of the Rohingya community, this was justice. Seeing Aung San Suu Kyi, one of the Nobel Prize, in an international court having to defend herself against these unspeakable acts of torture and rape and mass killing. And that was a form uh, of um, justice. But of course, you know, we look to what's happening right now in the United States and we see a president for the first time in history who says, maybe I won't leave. Maybe I'll stay. Maybe I'll challenge uh, everything that is going on. And we all hold the US up as a model for the rule of law. And I think this is a very dangerous moment. I think that Donald Trump has fascist tendencies. I think if necessary, he would resort to elements of fascism in order to basically sustain himself in power. We've now seen very clearly that he will stop at nothing to keep himself in power. And I think it's a very dangerous moment for the world because if this goes wrong in the United States, it will follow wrongly in the United Kingdom. And what hope is there then for other countries to uphold the idea of the rule of law, independent judges, a limited executive 
which is subject to legal constraints held to account by the courts. A parliament that is re respectful of legal obligations of national law and international law. So I think we are coming in the next six weeks to an absolute turning point for the future direction of the world. Because if the United States gets it wrong, the consequences I think, I fear, will be very grave for the rule of law. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, so we have the first question from uh, one of our attendees. So may I ask, Oleg, uh, включите микрофон Михайло Акимов. Можливо, щоб він поставив питання усно. Одну секундочку. Михайлові потрібно, ага, підняв, бачу, так. Так, звук включено. Михайло, uh, щиро дякую. Чи чутно мене? Так, чутно. Um, uh, so, uh, Professor Sands, uh, the question is, uh, is it really possible for Ukraine to seek for justice in the International Criminal Court without ratifying its uh, statute? Can you give me a bit more information, uh, what you have in mind? Because uh, you you're obviously think, uh, you obviously have something very specific in your mind. So the situation is that uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian parliament already uh, um, adopted uh, at least uh, two resolutions that uh, Ukraine is going uh, to um, consider the authority of International Criminal Court on uh, several cases uh, that uh, took place in Ukraine during the Revolution of Dignity and after that, afterwards, during the annexation of Crimea. But Ukraine still uh, did not ratify the International Criminal Court statute. So the question is, uh, what is on your opinion? Is it possible for Ukraine to seek for justice uh, in the International Criminal Court without ratifying its statute? The answer to that question is, I think, a question of treaty law. Um, the court has a limited jurisdiction. It has jurisdiction over four categories of international crimes, including crimes against humanity, and war crimes, both of which presumably could be addressed in some context in the Ukrainian situation. I don't think we're concerned with genocide. There's no jurisdiction over the events of the 1930s. That's plainly out. And the crime of aggression is not yet within the actionable jurisdiction of the court. So in what circumstances could the International Criminal Court exercise jurisdiction for crimes against humanity or war crimes in relation to acts that occur on the territory of Ukraine. Frankly, it's very difficult to see how the ICC could do it because it is a prerequisite that the court can only exercise jurisdiction in relation to the territory of a state which has ratified the statute of the International Criminal Court. The only way around that is if the Security Council was to adopt a resolution referring a matter to the ICC. But of course, that is unlikely to happen, particularly since Russia, I assume, would veto any resolution which could cause difficulties for the Russian state. Now, there is one case right now that is quite interesting. Uh, and that involves a community that I've already talked about, the Rohingya. As you know, the Rohingya is a community of about 1.3 million Muslims living in Myanmar, formerly Burma, who were attacked, many people killed, many women raped, uh, tortured, and 700,000 of them fled over the border to Bangladesh. And they now live in refugee camps in terrible conditions. Question, can the International Criminal Court exercise jurisdiction over any of the crimes that were committed in relation to the Rohingya? Myanmar is not a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court. So the court has no jurisdiction over acts that occurred in Myanmar. But there is a case right now before the court concerning some of the people, the Rohingya who crossed into Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court. So if the act occurs on the territory of Bangladesh, but relates 
to Myanmar, the court may be able to exercise jurisdiction. And the court has recently given the authorization to the prosecutor to proceed with an investigation of whether the inability of members of the Rohingya community who now find themselves in Bangladesh to return to Myanmar is a crime against humanity. Basically, forced expulsion, inability to return to your home. And that is the first case. That opens a possible door to the kind of scenario where in an indirect way, something that has happened in Ukraine could be within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court if it also has effects on the territory of, say, Austria or Germany or some other country that is a party. But it would only be a very limited jurisdiction. And so I think that the simple answer is, if Ukraine is serious about the court exercising jurisdiction over matters of real importance and concern, it would first have to ratify the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the answer for such a tricky question. Mm. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Philip. And also, I will just add to my colleague uh, Mikhail that uh, in Ukraine still is a very huge discussions among should Ukraine or not ratify the uh, Rome statute uh, due to uh, because there is such a myth or theory that not ratify uh, that ratifying will make our uh, soldiers who were uh, who are who were fighting in the eastern Ukraine uh, to be responsible at the Hague. So there is a kind of very moral uh, question and discussions, but all international legal society is supporting and currently is very pressing on the um, parliament and on the government that Ukraine should ratify and do it as quickly as possible. Still, the situation is a bit of so, Carlo, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, good evening, everyone. Professor Thans, thank you so much for taking time and uh, participating. Can, can we see discussion. you, Nadia? Can you put your camera on so that we can see who's talking to us? Or is that not possible? I think oh. in, this, in this regime, it's not possible. In this regime, okay. Yeah, because it uh, depends on, the, or, 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 on organizers, but still. Yeah, well, I'd rather not. I'm currently recovering from coronavirus. Oh, all, so. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Are, are you, are you, are you re truly recovering? Uh, hopefully, I'm, I'm taking it uh, I'm as well. Thank, uh, thank you again for um, for this um, uh, for, for, for this event. Um, I wanted to thank you first of all, of course, for the East West Street. Um, I personally participated in probably I don't know hundreds of discussions with people about it all around the world, and single-handedly gifted maybe ten or twelve copies to uh, my friends abroad. Uh, and I have a question concerning what you said about crossing the lines. Um, it's very, it seems very easy to understand what a line is when you're offered something illegal, like in your example, uh, when the judge is refusing a bribe. But the problem yeah. seems is that sometimes those lines are not so clearly defined, can be a little murky, and especially for young lawyers at the beginning of their career, when, for example, a lot of the tasks will come from the partners at your law firm or your superiors, and you can't just resign from the position. So yeah. what would your advice be on, you know, how, how do you define those lines that you should never do or yeah. never cross? Na Nadia, it's really good to speak to you. You must be what, about 19 years old? Uh, no, well, slightly older. <laughs> oh, okay, because it said in the chat you read East West Street in 2015, so that came out four years ago. So uh, no, 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 it's, it's another, it's another. <laughs> ah, okay, 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 sorry, then I've got confused. Um, so, so you're not the student who, who is at, you're not, it's not that chat question. Uh, no, yeah. it's not. I've, I've actually, I've already graduated from Tarashevchenko okay, University. Okay, so what are you doing, so what are you doing, what are you doing now? 
what what what's your position in life? What's your, what what's uh, your... I'm an associate with Integritas Law Firm. My okay. major in international arbitration. Okay. Um, particularly interested in investment arbitration. Okay. But probably questions on that. Um, questions to you on on those issues will probably be saved for another lucky opportunity to yeah <laughs> to to yeah. have you. You'll understand. Um, I have to be a bit careful on that, and I <laughs> I, I, avo I avoid. I mean, you you're. You are the future of Ukraine. I mean, you know, the legal community is a hugely important community and you are the community that will make the difference. And you are going to face, I have no doubt, some really tough situations. Um, because I know, and my conversations with Ivan, we've talked about this so many times. What do you do when you are a young person who finds themselves in a situation where a more senior, more powerful person tells you to do something. And if you don't do it, you will in some way pay a price. We talked before with Ivan about paying a price if, if, if you do certain things. And there are, is also the matter of the financial situation. I know how difficult it is for many younger people. And it's going to get more difficult in the coronavirus period. I know in Britain and in France, it's now becoming very difficult for a lot of people. And I'm sure in Ukraine, it is the same. And, you know, as a young lawyer, what do you do when someone comes along and says, well, you know, if you could sign me a letter which gives a favorable interpretation or something to a text, I will help you, quote unquote. What do you do? I, I mean, it's not for me to tell anyone else what to do. Everyone finds their own way of doing things. I'm in a very lucky situation. I teach at university. I have tenure. I'm not dependent on income of that of my law practice to pay my mortgage, to feed my children, to take a holiday. Who am I to say, no, you shouldn't do that, or yes, you should do this? I, I think the simple answer, and it's not a simple answer, it's a complicated answer, I think it comes from deep within each person. To, uh, each person asks themselves the question, where are my lines and will I be able to live with myself if I cross a certain line? No law, no regulation, no rule, no third person can tell you. It, it comes from inside you and you will know. And sometimes there are some gray areas where it's perhaps not such a bad line. It's a minor line. And, and that may well be right. There may well be minor lines. You know, in English, the expression is little white lies where, okay, it's not so honest, but it's not dishonest either. It's as that expression goes in English, or it's economical with the truth. I think you have to work out for you looking forward to the totality of your life can you really live with yourself if and when you cross certain lines? And I think about that, for example, in relation to Vechter. In, in August 1942, Heinrich Himmler flew to the city of Lviv. He spent one day with Vechter and Katzmann, his SS commandant. And Himmler said to Vechter, you have a choice. You stay here in Lviv and you carry on doing what needs to be done. In other words, you kill half a million people. Or you can go back to Vienna and we will find you a nice desk job where you will have a quiet, less exciting, less lucrative life. The choice is yours. Wächter spent a millisecond deciding he would stay. He wanted to be where the action was. He wanted the glamour and the glory of being at the top. And he didn't seem to mind that in obtaining that glory and glamour and the properties and the paintings and the houses and everything else that came with it, he would cross one of the greatest and most terrible of lines. I'm not saying you're ever gonna be in that situation but the principle I think stands. And when you come to that situation, you have to find within yourself. And the thing to do, I think, 
And I did it in my life on a number of occasions. I took risks. I have withdrawn from cases. I have said no to certain things. At a time in my career where I was much younger and it wasn't clear what would come next. But the thing that I have learned is when you develop a reputation for identifying lines and sticking to those lines, for every person who dislikes you because you don't cross the line, there will be at least one other who will say, that's the lawyer I want, because that is a lawyer who doesn't cross lines. And I would encourage you to reflect on those alternative options. It may mean for a transitional period, life is not so easy. It may mean for a few months, there's no income or less income. But there will be others out there who will respect you and who will ultimately hire your services and use you precisely because you become the one who is known as having a fearless reputation. I'm thinking of a man like Sidney Kentridge, the white lawyer who became the defense lawyer for Nelson Mandela in 1964, when Nelson Mandela was accused of terrorism charges. Sidney Kentridge paid a big price immediately for taking the case of Nelson Mandela. But when Nelson Mandela came out of prison in the early 1990s, one of the first people he said he wanted to see was Sidney Kentridge. And they remained friends for the rest of Mandela's life. Times change. Don't only ask yourself, what is the benefit or the cost today or tomorrow? Ask yourself, what is the benefit or the cost in 10 years or in 15 years or in 20 years? When a different regime is in power, when different people have authority, when different people are in control. But ultimately, it comes internally from you. It's a huge question, a, a, a so important question you've just asked. Thank you so much for asking that question. And I'm sorry to take so long answering it, but it's really a complex question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I see Irena Polovac and then we'll switch mic to Sofia who uh, left this message. Olya Kolchubovska, Irene, and then Sofia. Oblyuchenko. Can you hear me now? Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Sands, for uh, taking the time to deliver this presentation today. And thank you very much for your brilliant work, of which I'm a great fan. Um, I've heard that you're working on a new book, and I was wondering whether, to the extent possible, you could unveil some details about this new work. Are you talking about the Pinochet book? I, I think so, yeah. Okay. I've seen a post on your Twitter account, yeah. and I was, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm doing, I'm doing a little one. Um, which will come out in two years, which is on decolonization. And it's about basically the crimes of the British on colonialism, which of course is a big issue in Ukraine too, because Ukraine was basically a colony for 50 years. And uh, I've become very interested in colonialism. One of the things that is important, Ivan, Ivan now understands this, but in, in Britain, it is a matter of honor to act against your own country. And you don't get punished for it and people respect you for it. And so I have been the lead lawyer for the United Kingdom in a case uh, involving a place called Chagos, C-H-A-G-O-S, which is a small illegally occupied colony in the Indian Ocean, illegally occupied by the British. And we just got a decision last year of the International Court of Justice saying that Britain is an illegal occupier and it must leave. And I'm very proud of this case. And so I'm gonna write a small book that will be published in 2022 on that uh, and the story of one lady from the Chagos archipelago, a remarkable lady. But the Pinochet case is, is the next phase in what is sort of a trilogy. You've got East West Street and the Rat Line and then a book which tentatively is called Pinochet in London. And with each book, there is a passing of the baton. So Hans Frank is a big character in uh, East West Street and Otto Vechter is a tiny character as, as Ivan knows. And Otto Vechter becomes the big character in the Rat Line. In the Rat Line, there is a tiny character called Walter Rauf. And Walter Rauf emerges in the story because in 1949, 
he was an SS officer also indicted for mass murder who went on the run. And he ended up in Rome in April 1949, living in a monastery, the Vigna Pia Monastery run by the Vatican. And he was then sent to Syria to escape. And Otto Wächter occupied the room vacated by um, Walter Rauf in the Vigna Pia Monastery. So Rauf whose claim to fame is that in 1941, he is the inventor of the mobile gas chamber, the little vehicles that would drive around parts of occupied Europe, including Ukraine and Poland, bringing up people they wanted to gas in groups of 20 or 30 in the back of a van. He invented that. He flees to Syria in 49. He stays in Syria for a year. He then goes to South America. And in 1955, he ends up in Chile. And he becomes a small businessman in a southern town of Chile called Punta Arenas. Then in 1973, Pinochet comes to power in Chile. And it is said that Walter Hauf becomes an advisor to the government of Pinochet on techniques of interrogation of uh, opponents of the regime. And he interrogates or tortures, depending on your interpretation, allegedly a young Chilean writer who 17 years later in 1990 writes an affidavit alleging that Walter Hauf tortured him. And that affidavit becomes part of the case that landed on my desk in 1998 when Senator Augusto Pinochet came to London for medical treatment, as you will remember, and was arrested in his hospital room in the center of London. He was indicted, unbelievably, for crimes against humanity and genocide by a Spanish prosecutor, the very crimes that have their origins in the city of Lviv. And these matters landed on my desk by incredible coincidence on the very day of my grandfather's funeral in Paris, where Pinochet asked me to act for him as one of his lawyers. So you have the story of crimes against humanity going from Lviv in the early 1900s to London in October, 1998, uh, with my involvement in the case. I didn't act for Pinochet in the end, I acted on the other side. And so the book will tell two stories the story of Walter Rauf and the story of Pinochet's trial in London, which has never been told uh, what happened, how he was arrested, how he was caught, how the trial went away, went on, uh, and how it continued. And um, I follow the same style as East West Street and the Rat Line, namely uh, it, talking to people who were involved. And I've just finished actually just last week a lengthy, lengthy Zoom interview. I was supposed to go to Chile, but obviously I can't go because of coronavirus, with the man that I sat next to in the courtroom in the House of Lords for six weeks uh, between October, November 98 and March 99, who was Pinochet's principal advisor on human rights. <laughs> and curiously, we became friends. And even though we were on opposite sides. And he has just told me the whole inside story of being with Pinochet, which is beyond imaginable, uh, including flying back with Pinochet when Pinochet was released and how they opened a bottle of champagne when the plane entered Chilean airspace. So that's the story I'll tell. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I see that Danilo will collect the rest hands. We notice it. So I just ask Ola Puchita Sofia uh, for the champion perform. But Sofia has written uh, that uh, one of her dreams today has uh, been uh, in uh, reality. So maybe we'll give her opportunity to express it to, uh, in the words. Оля, можеш включити мікрофон? Не можу, не бачу, щоб Софія від, підняла руку. Софія, можете підняти руку, будь ласка? Павлюченко. О, є, так. Софія, uh, we have a photograph of Sofia, which is... Софія, вас чути. Yeah. Good evening. Hello, uh, well, hello, Sofia. I said, 
I said everything in my message. Just yeah. I'm very worried, so that's why I have written. I'm really happy to listen to you tonight, and just thank you. While while I was listening to you, one question appeared. How mm. was your last 24 hours? Did you really learn Ukrainian? <laughs> yeah. No, you know, um, Sophia, firstly, it's lovely to see you. You are the most important generation, the law student of Ukraine today. One of the things that I've loved about Ukraine and, um, and Lviv, and Ivan again will remember this, when I came, when East West Street came out in Ukrainian and we did the launch and event in Lviv, and you remember we were there amazingly with Henry Marsh, the neurosurgeon, and we went and did an event on a Sunday morning. And I said to Ivan and Sophia Diak, my friend at the Center for Urban History, who's gonna come to a book event with two old men on a Sunday morning. And she said, you wait and see, there will be people there. And we arrived and it was unbelievable. It was absolutely full. And it was full of young people. You know, when I do book events in Britain and Germany and France, there are many people, but they're almost all older people, very few younger people, except of course, when I do events at the university, which I do a lot. And it was so exciting to be in that event. I think you were there, Ivan, weren't you, that, that Sunday morning? it had an absolute magical electrical quality to it because from my perspective and from Henry's perspective, we were with the future of Ukraine. This is, you are the community, you are the generation who will make Ukraine powerful and great and honorable and strong and independent and decent. And you are, I think now studying uh, law and uh, I wish you every success and I'm looking forward to meeting you when I'm next in, I will be in Kiev actually, I can tell you now, I already know when I'm gonna be in Kiev because I was invited to go to the Museum of National History um, in, in Kiev um, to mark the occasion of the 80th anniversary of Babi Yar, which will take place next autumn, next October, I think, in, um, or September, October, in Kiev and I will come to Kiev for that. And the reason that they've invited me to come is very touching for me. They've invited me sort of as an honorary Ukrainian. They've asked me to make a donation to the museum uh, of some of my grandfather's objects as a man born in Lemberg, which is Ukraine, Lviv. And I've said, yes, of course, I will give those things to the, to the museum. And they then said, would I come and talk about them on that occasion? So I will, I mean, coronavirus permitting, um, I will be there. So no, uh, dear Sophia, uh, one of my great humiliations is that in, when did I first come? October 2010, exactly 10 years ago. My Ukrainian is pathetic. And <laughs> it's a source of misery for me that I have not been able to engage even in the most basic of conversations. I love hearing Ukrainian. I love speaking the few words that I can. As Ivan knows, I love Ukrainian food. You have the best pickles and the best borscht in the world. Pickles and, and I always, uh, now only buy Ukrainian vodka um, for reasons that are just, you know, emotional on my part. Um, but maybe, what I should undertake, and maybe you'll be there, Sophia, in the museum, and you'll come and say hello, that I will here undertake to say my opening words, my first paragraph, when I give my little speech, I will speak them in Ukrainian. And maybe with your help, you can translate them for me, you can get in touch with Ivan, he knows how to find me, and together the three of us will write the opening paragraph in Ukrainian, of the speech I will give in the National Museum. Okay, I'm a, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. find, please find me on Facebook and we will manage all this. Yeah. Uh, okay, Danilo uh, Volkovetsky, and I think it will be a final question because we're a bit of, uh, out of time. Okay. So, Olya, could you please put Danilo on the phone? Danilo, shoot a Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Good evening. Yes, yes, everyone. absolutely. Uh, Lovely to hear you. And thank you for a great discussion. I have only one question for you, and keeping up with the topic of Ukraine. So, my question is, do 
do you consider ever writing a book about Ukraine's Holodomor? Because this topic seems to align with your academic interests. Yeah. And a publication on this topic will certainly raise awareness about the strategy in the world. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. no, that's really interesting. I get asked a lot about the Holodomor, and I've talked about it a lot. I've never, I don't think, I don't think I've written a book about it, and I don't, I haven't written an article about it. I've certainly mentioned it in some of my writings. As you know, Raphael Lemkin treated the events of the 1930s, the Holodomor, as a genocide, and because of that, some of his books today in Russia are banned. Uh, I'm not sure if you were aware of that fact, but obviously I have another hat. I'm the president of English Pen, the Writers Association, and I don't like books being banned. And I certainly don't like Raphael Lemkin's book being banned because he refers to those events as a genocide. I mean, I suspect it's going to be very difficult for me to write a whole book on it on my own. So why don't I throw out this challenge? Why don't I do as happens in certain cases? Maybe Ivan should write that book. And just as he wrote the forward to my book, I can then write the forward to his book. Or maybe you who've asked the question will write a book. I often write forwards to books as a way of signaling my support for what they are done. Uh, my writing commitments are pretty full for the next five to six years. I doubt I'm going to get that in, but please understand that is not a lack of respect and it is not a lack of interest. I get asked a lot about those events. And I always give the same answer that I think Lemkin would have given if the crime of genocide had existed in 1930, as it should have, then the events that were described in the Holodomor would meet the definition of a genocidal act. I don't think there's much doubt uh, about that. But of course, they occurred before the concept of genocide had been invented. And so it's like um, the killing of the Armenians in, in the Ottoman Empire, there is just a big debate, is this a genocide or not? And that's a debate about the temporal aspect of law. But I'm deeply interested in the subject. I want to know more about it. And I'm very happy to commit to contributing or writing a forward uh, for a book. Uh, Ivan, you're looking horrified at the idea that I've suggested you might write a book in the next six weeks on this huge Yeah, it's, it's because currently I'm working on two monographs <laughs> of mine and it's, it's a certain book will, will be very challenging. You are young, Ivan, there is time. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's always a time, but still we're out of time of our today's event. Yeah. The last thing you have, you, you can see, Philip, that An Angelina uh, says uh, uh, hello to Henry Marsh. Yes, I saw time. that. I will say hello. He's very well. Yeah, it's yeah because his he and his book are also very popular in Ukraine. Yeah. And also one of his books I now I recommend uh, uh, recommend to all lawyers, special uh, student of lawyers, because yeah. sometimes. His profession and professional yeah. lawyers are very much the same. Well, Henry, Henry and I have agreed that one day we will swap jobs in Ukraine. <laughs> he will come and give a law lecture, and I will do a single act of brain surgery on some poor Ukrainian person. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just say I'm looking forward to Henry's lecture, but uh, on the other things. <laughs> Best to avoid me, I think. Uh, sounds like a great plan. So, Philip, thank you very much for your hour of your time. It was a very interesting discussion. I think I know that you're a very open person, and now I know that a, a couple of more, uh, a couple of dozens of people more in Ukraine know that you're a very open uh, person. You can easily speak and uh, find uh, personal approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, let's keep in touch, and I strongly hope that our times will become better soon, and uh, we will be able to meet with you. Or, or in other places. Thank and you so looking, much, Ivan. Thank you so much for inviting and me. And looking forward uh, to Ukrainian uh, edition of Redline because it's, well, this book will also become, I'm sure, become a bestseller. In yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Dziękuję Filip, and uh, see you soon uh, during our next events. Thank you, Philip, so much. Thank you. Bye.